Hello, everyone. For those of you joining us um, asynchronously, welcome to the third beginner track workshop. Today, we'll be covering linear regression, which is a very popular machine learning model. Here's a link to the slides. Hopefully, everyone's had a chance to get the link. And if not, um, just ask one of the officers and we'll drop a link in the chat. Also, please log on to the membership portal um, and create an account if you don't, if you haven't already, just so you can keep track of all the events that ACM is hosting and just have an idea of when our upcoming events will be. There's also prizes for people that attend the most event and gather the most points. Okay, so here's a brief overview of what today's workshop will look like. We're gonna start off with a fun motivating example of why we would, um, why we need linear regression or what the motivation is behind this model that we're gonna learn about today. And then we're gonna delve into exactly how it works um, briefly kind of review some math. Hopefully it'll be a review, but even if it's not, we'll just kind of touch on some math that'll be helpful to understand the theory behind machine, um, between, behind linear regression. And then Nikhil is going to go ahead and talk about a loss function. Um, and if you're not sure what a loss function is, we're going to get into that later as well. But here's just a brief overview. Uh, so let's consider a scenario where Joe Bruin has a midterm this week, like many of you do. And um, he's very confused on how he's gonna do. And he really wants to have a ballpark on what his score might be. So given that very vague situation, what are some questions that you might ask Joe Bruin to determine how well he's gonna do on his midterm? Let's say we're, um, we're basing it off a of percentage. So in the chat or unmute yourself, feel free to drop some ideas. What are some questions or what are some things to consider to figure out how well Joe Bruin's gonna do on his midterm? Um, I would probably ask him how he did on his past midterms and then see whether those like conditions are the same, like if he felt the same way going into each midterm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good metric to use. How many hours he studied, definitely. Difficulty of the class, that's true. Okay, so those are some great answers. Um, and you guys hit on some of these already. Time spent studying or also like how many lecture hours he attended. If he didn't go to class and is expecting to do well in the midterm, he might not do as well. So all of these different ideas that you guys tossed out or different metrics that you suggested we use to determine his performance are what we call features in machine learning. Um, and a feature is basically a variable that we expect to contribute to our um, prediction of choice. So in this case, what we're trying to predict is his midterm performance. And the features that we thought might impact that are time spent studying or how he did on his past midterms um, and the difficulty of the class. And um, in machine learning, like the essential thing that you're trying to figure out often is what the relationship exactly is between these features and the output. So when you guys toss out ideas such as how difficult the class is or how long he spent studying, how do you know exactly how those values or um, yeah, like the exact number of hours he studied, how that's going to translate to his midterm score? We want to be able to quantify this. So our model in the future when we have Josie Bruin, who also wants to figure out how well she's gonna do on her midterm. Um, we wanna be able to use the same model for both of them and be able to predict the score. Okay, so uh, not only do we wanna figure out like how strongly the correlation is between these variables, we wanna like know if it's positively correlated or negatively correlated. And as humans, we already have some kind of previous knowledge that helps us determine this, right? Like if someone studied longer, we would expect them to do better on the midterm. If someone's class is known to be more difficult, we expect them to do not as well on the midterm. So can someone um, just shoot out like a very, very vague idea of what three variables you'd use on predicting the midterm score and how strongly you think they'd correlate to our target? This is just a fun exercise, so don't worry about being super precise about it. 
And if you can, maybe try to get like, try to be as specific as possible with the relation that you're trying to map between these features and the score. Again, feel free to mute yourself. I'm just gonna sit here and wait until someone wants to unmute or say something in the chat. Are there any questions about what the question was though? It's basically what um, we're asking at the bottom of the slide. How would you model it? How would you model this problem of predicting how well someone's gonna do on their midterm? Wait, sorry, do you also want like a number to quantify it too? If you, um, that would be great. I mean, you don't have to base this off of anything. We know this is just a random exercise we're throwing at you. But if you want to toss in numbers, that would be even better. OK, awesome. We got an answer in the chat that said, uh, for those of you watching the recording, for most to least, how he's done in the past, the difficulty of the class, and how much they've studied. Um, yeah, that, that's a great answer. So you pick three variables that you think are very indicative of the score and you're gonna order them in a certain way. Can we push this like one step further and discuss exactly what the relationship will be between these three variables and the output? Like, let's say we're trying to get the exact percentage. What's something that you might do? Thank you for the response, by the way. Appreciate that. You would just put a coefficient in front of it, right? Or, and then see if it's like positive or negative and like how big of a magnitude it is. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so Austin suggested that we take these variables and then put a number in front of it. So let's say one of the variables or one of the features was how many hours you studied. You can multiply that by a coefficient was the term you used. And then um, using that equation, we can get a final answer, a percentage. That's that's great. So um, we kind of touched on linear, what, like the higher idea behind linear regression already, actually. But let's break it down a bit further. Hopefully, that exercise was a good starting point for what we're about to get into. So some review of terminology, really quick. So the property of the object that impacts the target, which is a fancy way of saying just like the variable that we think is influential towards like what we're trying to predict. That's what we call a feature. Does anyone have any questions about what a feature is? Or can someone explain it in their own words in the chat? if someone's typing while we're waiting for them. Um, and the target or label is what you're trying to predict. So it's your, it's it's the entire purpose of building this model. So you can get this output value. So in our example right now, what's the target? What's the label that we're trying to predict? Midterm score, perfect. Just to really hone in this idea, I'm gonna throw out an example that we briefly discussed two weeks ago regarding housing prices. If you guys remember what that example was, what are some features that we would use in the predicting a housing price example and what's the target? I just gave it away, but. Yeah, the target was the house price and then we, we used stuff like how big the house is, if it's in a nice neighborhood, how many rooms it has, and like other features. Yeah, you hit the nail on that. Uh, so hopefully everyone understands right now what a feature and what a target or a label is. But if at any point you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. So, so far, what we've been discussing was data at high level, right? We're essentially looking at 
um, data of interest. Regarding Joe Bruin or Josie Bruin, we were talking about data on how many hours they studied, how difficult the class is. Um, and we need to have some kind of formal way to represent this data. So here we can look at a pretty um, interesting or a pretty informative chart. Each of these columns, uh, can someone say in the chat what we'd call homework average, study hours, lecture hours, and then what the midterm percentage would be? I can just go over it. So um, the homework average, study hours and lecture hours, those are all features, right, that we're looking at. And each row represents a different student. So 70%, 10 hours studied, 18 lecture hours, those are all values um, or data that we put in per student, which is each row um, for these features. So whenever we get a new, exactly, the features and the target. So whenever we get a new data point, the feature values that we're getting don't change. Like we're always getting the homework average, study hours, lecture hours, and we're trying to predict the midterm percentages. But the actual values that we have for those um, features will vary from data point to data point. And when we're referring to a data point, we're essentially referring to this row right here in the data table. And often you will see this vector right here. And a vector is basically a container of values. Um, this vector right here of all your target values is referred to as the y, the y vector or the target value vector. So um, someone suggested this earlier that we put in a coefficient in front of each of our variables and use that to predict our output. And um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, you were referring to a linear model. So if you look at this picture right here, um, this is a really pretty simple linear model where if you were to figure out the best fit line between homework averages and midterm scores, and let's say the line, oh, you, I hope you can see my pointer. Let's say the line is right here. All you would need to map this line is a coefficient that you'd multiply the homework average by to get midterm score. And you probably have some kind of bias term or y-intercept term um, to figure out where that line with a given slope is gonna be passing this y-axis, right? So all of us are familiar with mapping a line. Um, we usually have the slope value and the y-intercept value, and we can map a relationship between homework averages and midterm scores. But often when we're trying to predict a value, you're not dealing with just one variable. There's a lot of very, there's a lot of different variables that can help us determine, help us predict what that final score will be. So um, in this simple 2D graph, it's easy to see that linear relationship, but hopefully in your mind, you can kind of map the same idea when you're dealing with multiple different variables, yet they all have a linear relationship with the output. Even if you can't visualize that line in like a four-dimensional space or a five-dimensional space. There's a slide later that goes into what our parameters are, but essentially parameters are the coefficients or the weights that we put in front of our um, variable values that help us output our midterm score or our variable of interest. So before we dive more into linear regression, let's just kind of backtrack and review what uh, machine learning is aiming to do that's kind of different from the standard approach to problem solving. So in machine learning, we aim to predict the midterm score of a student, let's say, by determining the pattern between certain features to students and the target. So earlier when we were explaining like, okay, so you just multiply each data point. So we, ha we had a graph right here, right? We just multiply study hours by a certain number, by a certain parameter, lecture hours by a certain parameter, and you get the target. Um, that, but these values vary from student to student, right? So how do you determine what the best parameters are? That is what machine learning is trying to predict. You're trying to figure out the pattern or the relationship between your inputs and your outputs. And your inputs are these variables and your output is the target. And how we quantify this pattern 
in linear regression is by figuring out the weights, what you would multiply each value by to get the output. This is a graph that we had in our presentation two weeks ago for workshop one. Um, so we're gonna hand this over to the audience members again now. Can someone please explain what the difference is between traditional programming and the machine learning approach? And I wanna emphasize one point. When we say we learn the weights, the input values are gonna differ, right? From data point to data point. So um, if I have just two people's data values, if I have just like, um, yeah, if I have just two people's data values, it'll be pretty easy to get a relationship between those two people's input values and the output. But when I'm dealing with a lot of data, I need to be able to have a generalizable model, you know, that gives us a really good prediction. So that's what machine learning is aiming to do. So can someone kind of summarize the difference between traditional programming and the machine learning approach? And preferably someone we haven't heard from yet. Okay, someone in the chat said, we use data to train our program in ML rather than using the program to generate data in regular CS. Okay, I think you're definitely on the right track there. Um, in regular CS though, we're not generating, I think by generate data, you meant generate results or like generate our predictions. But um, yeah, that the, the point of using data to train our program is exactly what we're trying to do. We're using data and past output values. So someone suggested, we see how Joe did on his past midterms and then use that to predict how he's gonna do on future midterms. So when we see how he did on past midterms, we're not just gonna look at how many hours he studied, how many, um, how difficult the class was. We're also gonna look at what his midterm score actually was. And then using that input and output value, we can sort of figure out a relationship using some you know, knowledge and then use that relationship we kind of map in the future when we don't know what the midterm score is gonna be, but we still have this input value um, and then we can make predictions. Trevor, did you have something to say? You unmuted. Uh, no, I was adjusting my volume. And I okay, sorry about that, put you on spot. I'm gonna pause here to take any questions. Does anyone have any questions or comments to make? Okay, we'll keep going then. So in today's presentation and throughout this track, we're mainly going to be focusing on these two areas of machine learning pipeline. So usually when you have data to work with, you need to process that data um, in a way that's feasible for you to work with. And then you can train a model using that data. So then you can give that model data that it hasn't seen yet and then make predictions out of it that are useful for you. So the focus of today's workshop and this track will be figuring out different ways you can train your model or different models that you can train so you can use data to make useful predictions. So the idea that I've been talking about over and over again regarding um, having some parameters, multiplying that with your input values and then having some output like midterm score, that's what we call a hypothesis function. So just like in science, when we talk about hypothesis, um, we're usually talking about what we think is a relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. So in a similar way, in a hypothesis function in machine learning, we're trying to figure out a function that will take inputs and then tell us what the output will be. So what model should we use? We just talked about a linear model so far where we simply multiply um, our input values by some coefficient, add in some bias term, and then we get a prediction. But often a relationship between inputs and outputs are much more complicated than that. And if you go on to take advanced track, you'll actually um, look into neural networks, which are much more complicated than linear regression, but also a lot more interesting too. But I think linear regression is kind of like the step one of figuring out this relationship. 
And um, it's an also, even though it's simple, it's an extremely useful tool in machine learning. So that's the model that we'll be talking about today. But anytime you hear the word model, you're just talking about something that maps a relationship between inputs and an output. It's honestly nothing more than that. So um, this is something we already hit on in prior slides, but ultimately like in our midterm score, ex midterm score example, a linear model might be a good choice. So here, x1, x2, um, all the way up to xn, we're dealing with n different variables that we're going to take data from. And w1, w2, wn, um, they come from our weight vector, and those are our coefficients. Those are the things that we're trying to figure out, and they're the ones that map the relationship. And then x1, x2, all the way up to xn is actually just our input data. Does this equation look familiar to people? Um, just because I feel like in math, we kind of, we come across linear regression models, like knowingly or unknowingly pretty often. So hopefully this equation looks pretty understandable. Just keep in mind that often W denotes the weights and X, the X vector often denotes the actual um, data that you're putting in. And this is our hypothesis function that's essentially mapping our input to our output. Okay, here's, um, here's a more formalized way to look at it. So often when we are dealing with data, it comes in the form of a matrix or a vector. So here, we're, the, x the x vector has all our input data. So this is filled with like actual data values. So let's say this is an input vector giving us Joe Bruin's data. X1 might be the number of hours he studied. X2 might be the number of hours he spent procrastinating. Um, and W1 is a variable that is meant, W1 will be um, a value that is meant to map the number of hours he studied to the output. So if we compute the dot product of the W vector and the X vector, you would get this equation at the top. Are there any questions on how we formalize the relationship we were talking about earlier between the input and then the output? I wanna emphasize here that W here is something that's completely um, owned in a sense by the model. X is just what the model is given in and Y is what the model is outputting. What is B? Okay, that's an excellent question. So if we go back to this, one second. If we go back to this equation right here where we're only dealing with one input variable, um, I can have the weight vector be, I can have the weight value be five. Let's, or here the relationship is one to one almost. So if I did, if 0.4 was my average on the homework, 0.4 was the score on the midterm. But with the same weight vector, you can have multiple actual graphs, right? As long as B is different. So if this was a line, I hope you can see my pointer. Your B is the Y intercept, by the way. So if this was the line, B would be zero. But with the same weight, with the same slope, I can have a line over here that might better map my relationship and B would be 0.6. So B is also a parameter that you're, um, B is also a parameter that you're trying to learn in order to be able to better represent your data. So even though the relationship is essentially the same when the line is over here versus when the line is over here, B helps you better fit it just by, I guess, like adjusting your line accordingly. Does that make sense? But in familiar terms, your B is kind of like the y-intercept of your data. Sorry, and what was the T again? What was the what? The T. Oh, um, transpose. Thank you for bringing that up. Let me just go back to where we were. You're talking about this T right here, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, that's a great question. So that's just so that our math is done cleanly. So when we're given 
a weight vector, and then the input data vector. Um, both of them come in the form of columns. So when you're looking at W, W isn't referring to this. W would be referring to something that's um, structured also like a column with W1, W2, Wn. So what WT denotes is the transpose of W, which essentially you're just kind of flipping it from being vertical to horizontal. So this way, um, if you're familiar with matrix multiplication, you would take the row and multiply it with the column, right? So W1 gets multiplied by X1, W2 gets multiplied by X2. So the reason you take the transpose is so that the dimensions check out when you're conducting vector multiplication. So the dimension of this weight vector right here would actually be um, n times one. And the dimension of this vector right here would also be n times one. But you can't multiply an n times one vector by an n times one vector. The second term in the um, the second term in the first vector has to be the same as the first dimension in the... I'm trying to see, what was the OK by in reference to? I hope you're following along. Um, but so the when we take the transpose of the weight vector, instead of it being n times 1, it now becomes 1 times n. So now we can multiply it with an n times 1 vector. And then your result will be a 1 times 1 vector or y. Does that make sense? So that's why you take the transpose. It's 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 only so that the vector multiplication happens smoothly. Gotcha. And then um, that makes sense. Do you have to like do that in your uh, program as well? Yes. So we'll actually be implementing linear regression in a later workshop. Um, it will be around week eight. So um, please show up to those workshops at the end. That's when we'll actually be implementing all the theory that we're learning. So you'll definitely see where we're taking the transpose of the weight vector when we're doing that. It's actually pretty clean how we do it. You'll be able to see all of this math being implemented. This is a review of what we've been discussing in the past couple slides. Can we again have an audience member explain it all to us? And I know that most of you are, have like just learned these concepts. So just give us like your highest level explanation. And the reason I keep pausing so many times is I think when you're passively learning something, even when you're taking in the information, it might be harder to recall later. But when you pause to explain it to yourself, we often retain the information better. And this is something that we're gonna refer back to in our next workshop. So it's really important that you, um, that you really understand it now. I can do my best to try and explain it. Yes, yeah, so that'd be great. Yeah, so um, like I think W and X both represent like your data, X mm -hmm. being like the types of like features you're looking at or like characteristics you wanna like use to predict. And then W is like the weight of each characteristic. So like how much emphasis you wanna put for like the amount of time you spend studying or such. And then that helps you create the equation or your linear regression model where um, you have to like multiply those two matrices together to get W1X1 plus W2X. Mm -hmm. And then B is just like what the what the data, I guess, like misses out because of the bias, I guess. I don't really know how to explain B, but yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for that explanation. I think you hit a lot of really good points. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to add? Okay, um, I want to emphasize one thing though. Uh, w the weight the weight matrix is not a part of our data. That's just something that the model owns. So if you if you kind of visualize the model as this kind of big black box, um, and inside the black box, we are trying to train what the weight vectors would be. And each student can come up to this black box and put in their information, and out comes the score. So when Joe Bruin or Josie Bruin come in to like figure out what their midterm score is gonna be, they don't have to bring their own weight matrix with them. That's the entire job of the black box. All they bring in is this X vector right here, information on what their past midterm scores were, information on how much they spent studying, how long they were procrastinating, how many other classes they're taking. You know, 
Only that information is what they bring to this black box. The black box itself holds the weight matrix. So it takes in this information, it knows what to do with it, and then it outputs Y, the midterm score. Does that make sense? And also, um, I know the B is just kind of hovering around, but it's actually very nicely integrated into this um, operation that we're doing here. So often what you see is the, um, the B, actually, I think that's something we can go over when we're implementing linear regression. But does anyone have any questions on what B actually is? It's just a bias term that the black box is also responsible for figuring out in order to be able to output Y. It's just another tool that your model uses in order to make a better prediction on what the output is. Um, this is kind of a random thought, but how come you, uh, like, would you ever want to make a new entry for like, say, W0 and uh, have a corresponding like X0, but set X0, X0 equal to one? Um, just to like add the B term to the matrix or the vectors. Okay, that's actually a brilliant suggestion. That's what I was suggesting that we come back to when we're actually implementing it um, because it more just has to do with making the math work out fine. But what Austin was talking about is instead of having this vector multiplication be separate and then adding B, we can just have B be a term in our weight matrix where we have B or we can, it's often referred to as W0 or W0. We have B here and then W1, W2. And when we take in our input data, um, we just automatically add in a one there. And the output would be essentially the same. We multiply the one by B and then W1 by X1, W2 by X2. So you just get B plus W1, X1 plus W2, X2. So that's exactly what we end up doing. So when we're implementing that, you'll see us adding a one to our input data so we can, so the dimensions check out and we can multiply with the weight matrix. That's really awesome though, that you came up with that and thought ahead. Let's pause for another audience question. Um, rank these four features on how much do you think they affect midterm scores? We'll call this one, two, three, and four, so the ranking is easier for you in the chat. You don't have to explain on, um, you wouldn't have to explain why you ranked the way you did. Okay. So it's really interesting that everyone has slightly different answers on how they would rank it. And I'd have to believe that you're basing this answer on past experience, right? And how important you think all these factors contributed to your midterm score or your friend's midterm score. So you're basing your prediction. Um, think of your mind as a model. You're basing your prediction on how your mind has been trained in the past, right? You've used, you've used data in the past number of classes that were taken, number of pets a student has, and the hours of um, sleep that you got the night before and what your score actually ended up being. You're using all the knowledge that you got from that past data to make a future prediction. So um, at a high level, that's what a model is doing. When you're training a model, you're giving it the input, um, at least a linear regression model, when you're training a linear regression model or in supervised learning, you're giving it the input and the output. And you're saying, hey, here's a bunch of input data, here's a bunch of output data, work with it, figure out what you think the relationship is gonna be. So when, in the future, when I give you input data that you haven't seen before, you should be able to figure out that, you should be able to use that relationship that you figured out to get this output. So what you guys kind of did is kind of access the training that you've had in your mind um, to figure out like which weight or which variables are most effective. Okay, uh, let's step away from the theory for a minute and talk about math. 
Does anyone here not know how to take derivatives or has not had the opportunity to learn about derivatives? Totally fine if you haven't. Feel free to private message me too if you don't want to say it. Um, just so I know how like end up to go into this. Okay. I think then I'm going to make the assumption that everyone's comfortable taking derivatives. Um, but conceptually, the derivative of a function is just the rate of change. So if the derivative is positive, then you know that your function is increasing. And if it's negative, you know the function is decreasing. So um, a topic that stems from derivatives. Does anyone know not know how to take partial derivatives? I know this is something that's covered in the 32 MAT series. So if you haven't taken that yet, it totally makes sense why you wouldn't know partial derivatives. Really, everyone's done partial derivatives. Okay, awesome. I got a message saying someone doesn't know partial derivatives and I'm really glad to hear that because that is something I learned after coming to college. Um, but if you're familiar with derivatives, then partial derivatives are very intuitively, intuitively the same. It's just that instead of dealing with one variable, when you're dealing with multiple variables, you take a derivative with respect to one variable, right? So if you look at um, f of x, y, which is a function um, of variables x and y, when you take a derivative of this, um, what that really means is you're taking a derivative with respect to one variable. So if I'm taking a derivative of f of x and y with respect to x, how you do that is what partial derivatives tell you. So um, it's really simple. Here, when you're dealing with the derivative with respect to x, you only look at the terms that have that variable in them. So since 3y squared, since that term doesn't contain x at all, you can ignore it. And you only derive terms that have the variable x in them and any other variable. So let's say instead of 2x, this was 2xy. Um, any other variable that's not the variable that you're, you're deriving with respect to, you just treat as a coefficient. So the, the partial derivative of this with respect to x would just be 2. If this was 2xy, the partial derivative would be 2y, because you're not treating y as a variable in that sense. You're just treating as a coefficient. So it just stays there, because you're only interested in the x term. We'll look at more examples in the next slide. But um, using the same philosophy, the partial derivative of this with respect to y would just be 6y, because you'd bring down the denominator you get six and you um, reduce, sorry, not denominator, the exponent, and then you subtract the exponent by one. So um, gradient descent is something Nicole is gonna be covering later in this workshop. A gradient of an n-dimensional function, a function that has n variables is basically an n-dimensional vector of the partial derivatives of the function with respect to each variable. All that saying is when you take any derivative, it's with respect to a variable. So think of a gradient as kind of the overall derivative of a function, you know, with respect to each individual variable. So here, the gradient of f, if f was a function of x, y, and z, would be a vector. Um, with each value being the derivative with respect to each of those variables. So let's do an example. Uh, I wish I can hide the bottom. Just, just ignore the bottom. I know it's hard to unsee it, but can someone explain why these gradient values are what they are? So um, the partial derivative of f with respect to x is sine y. Can someone unmute or in the chat say why that is? And the same goes to y and z. But we can have a different person explain each one. Yeah, the first one is just a power rule. So the sine y is just the coefficient of, of x. So that's why it's sine y. Yes, exactly. 
And um, chain rule and all that doesn't apply here when you're thinking of sine y, you're not multiplying it by cosine y with respect to x, again, because we're treating sine y because it only contains a variable y simply as a coefficient. You don't treat it as a variable when you're deriving with respect to x. But in this case, when you're deriving with respect to y, you do do chain rule and it becomes x cosine y. And with z, because you're not concerned with this term at all, because it doesn't have z in it, you're just treating it as a coefficient. So the derivative of that just becomes zero. And so here you end up with 6z squared. Is everyone comfortable with partial derivatives? Or comfortable as reach? If, if you were just introduced to this, not expect to be comfortable, but does everyone get the idea behind partial derivatives? Can I get like a yes in the chat or just a thumbs up reaction? I can't see your guys' faces, so that would be nice. Okay, awesome. Let's keep going then. Okay, here are some practice problems. What is the gradient of f in this case? And don't look at the chat before you, like think of the answer and then look at the chat. Okay. I appreciate the capital A. Okay, um, if anyone was confused between A and B, um, just keep in mind that a gradient is a vector and not a single term. Um, but I'm really glad to see that everyone went with A over B. If anyone has questions, we do have Ben and Nicol there monitoring the chat right now. So feel free to drop them at any point. Yeah. And if you want more practice with partial derivatives, just Google part, partial derivatives like worksheet and there will be plenty of practice problems to practice on. With that, um, we'll get into a loss function, which is essentially how you learn what these weights are, how our black box model learns what these weights are gonna be. And Nick Hill is gonna go over that. All right, yeah, so a loss function. So we have our, our model, like conceptually set up, we have our we have our weights that we haven't actually initialized yet and we are biased and we have our labels or the predictions. And so what we want to do now is be able to actually change our weights to maybe be kind of accurate. So we want to figure out like what the coefficient should be for like number of hours studied in the midterm example or number of hours procrastinating. And so the way we do that is we start by training and the way we train in this case is a loss function. And so a loss function, what it does is basically it determines how incorrect your predictions are or the model predictions are. And so how it does that is that, so for all of our training data, we all have, all of them have all the inputs, all the input parameters, like number of hours studied, number of hours procrastinated, um, number of classes taken, for example. And they also come with the, um, with the, the label as well. So they will have the actual score. So like, let's say someone studied for five hours, procrastinated for like um, 20 hours somehow in the single day. That's actually not possible. Never mind. Um, and take is taking five classes, and their actual score is um, 20. Kind of makes sense, but um, from that we can um, figure out how wrong our model is. And so um, to figure that out, we're actually going to use a certain for our for our purposes right now. We're going to use a certain loss function called mean squared error. Um, it'll show up in a second, but basically mean squared error is a is, is a way of basically figuring out how, how incorrect our predictions are for our current weights. And then based on that, we can update our weights and our um, our weights and our bias to show that. And so as you guys can see on the screen right now, our loss function takes in all the input parameters. So let's say y1 hat is number of hours studied, y2 hat is um, number of hours procrastinating and y, uh, ym hat is um, number of classes taken right now. And so as you guys can see, our loss function takes all those parameters in and from that, so we have one over m term, which is taking the average of the errors. And what we're doing is basically we're subtracting um, 
our prediction score. So basically, we're going to plug it into our model. Our model is going to do our linear our function on it. So our function is y hat equals um, b plus m m m one or w one x one w two x two onwards. So we had our old function. We're going to plug our inputs y one hat y two hat all the way y m hat into that function. And that's going to give us um, our predicted values. So that's y hat y one y i hat right there. So that's, a, that's what our model is currently predicting. And for that data point, we actually have the label itself. So we actually have the actual score that someone got for that midterm exam. And so what we can do is we can subtract the actual score that they got from the actual predicted value that our model got and then square that. Uh, and then based on that, we can do that for all um, um, our data points. And then we can take um, and all of our, um, and you can take the average of that. And so I guess a question I have for you guys is, why do you guys think this error, this error term of y, y i minus y i hat squared is squared? Like, why is there a square there? Like, why can't we just have like this, this, this subtraction by itself? So feel free to answer in chat or unmute and answer. But the question is, why are we squaring the error term in this case? In the meantime, we're gonna switch off screen sharing really quick. Yes, yeah, so I was, I was going to say the, the squared term is there because you could either underestimate or overestimate. And if you don't square it, then you're just going to be, you know, adding the sum. So, it, you know, it might sum to zero, uh, which is not what you want. And also, I know uh, they typically don't use the absolute value because they want like the cost function, whatever thing to be continuous. Uh, yeah, exactly. So basically what Austin said is exactly correct. Uh, I'll, first, I'll get screen up in a second. Um, that'll be up. But basically what Austin said to reiterate is that if we don't, don't have that square term there, we have our current order of subtracting. Actually, I'll put this guys up first, but um, let me share this real quick. Sorry about that. Um, here. Okay, sent. You guys see this? Thumbs up. All right, cool. Oh, I'll have to click through all the things again. All right. Yeah, but back to what Austin said, which is actually completely correct, is that so imagine we get rid of the square term. Now we have yi, which is the actual value, target value. So our actual midterm score is affected by our, our predicted value. But what if, so in one case, we could have our, our prediction. Our prediction could be lower than the actual target value, in which case our error is positive because target minus po our prediction will be positive in that case. But consider the converse situation. Let's say we have our prediction is actually larger than our target. Then our error term becomes negative. And so if we have some positive terms and some negative terms, they could cancel out. And so we could have an error of zero in that case, even though. Um, in fact, it should uh, our error could be much bigger than that, and so that's why we can't we can't have that's why we can't have a plain subtraction. And so you might say, like Austin pointed out, why don't you use absolute value? And actually, this is a, a decent solution, but one of the reasons why you don't use absolute value, which we'll get into, in a, uh, later um, for our linear regression project as well as in adva an advanced workshop, is that the absolute value function is kind of a pain to deal with, like in a um, differentiation wise. Um, because it has like a, if you guys see the graph, it's actually like a, it's kind of like a V. And so it has like a really sharp point at the zero, uh, X equals zero. And so you don't want to deal with that for um, um, derivation. So what we do instead, we use a square function because as you guys all know, X, the derivative of X squared is a pretty easy function to deal with. And so we use the square function because it gets rid of all the negative and positive terms. And it also doesn't, doesn't have any problems with differentiation. So, um, that's why we have square term there. And thanks for the answer, Austin. And so let's look at the uh, loss function as a function of your weights and, bi and the bias. And so in the, in the previous slide, we'll go back, we just talked about loss in general. But really cool for the linear, uh, for our linear regression is that we can actually write the loss function as a function of our weights and bias. And so what we have here is that. Um, Basically, 
you know how we have y we have our y hats currently written there but we know that y hat right now our y function as you can see on the right is a, is in terms of uh, our weights and our bias and so what we can do is that we can replace the equation on the left we have a y i hat we can replace that with the equation on the right and so instead of having our equation in terms of in terms of all of the uh, all of these um, data points of, of y hats, we can in actually instead put in our equation on the right. And so now we have our loss function in terms of the x's or data points instead of just um, the given data. Um, yeah, but basically, you can think of it now as our loss function is in terms of our data points. So you can think of it as for our midterm thing, now our loss function is in, term of, in, is in terms of data like number of hours spent studying, number of hours spent procrastinating, and um, number of hours spent, a number of classes taken. And so that's really helpful for trying to figure out how we should change these weights for those uh, functions to um, um, best to make, to make the best model possible. Any questions about that? Um, that's what can be kind of, kind of abrupt, but Quick summary is that um, our loss function is actually in terms of our weights and biases. Um, I'm sorry, I have a question. So for the Ys, they're just like predicted um, grades if it is under the context of the prediction of midterm grades, right? And for X, there are um, the properties that affects the outcome. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, Y1 hat through YM hat are actually um, a bunch of different scores. So let's say we have we have we have M people who like M people who took midterms, and so Y1 through YM are M different midterm scores. And so on the left we have basically we have M different midterm scores, and we want to basically see how much our prediction. Um, is different from our, from the actual result, and what we figure out is that um, we can actually um, um, plug in our equation for y hat, our hypothesis, into that equation to make it in terms of weights and biases instead. So yes, the y hats are um, midterm scores, and the x uh, the, the x what the x one x ends are are um, potential data points, and the weights are w's and the b's are biases. Okay, so uh, another question is, um, so for the loss function to work, we have, we have to already like established a hypothesized model for y hats, and then we can um, evaluate whether the loss function, uh, whether our model is um, accurate through the loss function. Yeah, so Typically, what you start out with is that um, maybe maybe to, to start you have randomized values, or typically you might you might have a general like idea of what the uh, what the coefficients could be, and then so you start with some parameters like that aren't trained yet, and as you get more data, uh, those weights get more and more uh, correct or more accurate to your data set. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. Any other questions or? Um, also, feel free to ask in chat too. Um, can't currently see chat, but um, then by the time we can. So, yeah. All right. I'll just um, feel free to stop me, but I'll move on to the next slide. All right. So, quick poll for all you guys in chat. Uh, I can't see chat. It's kind of annoying. But um, what does the loss function measure? Feel free to unmute or um, yeah, unmute uh, or write in chat. Oh, I can see, oh wait, maybe I can see chat now. This could be epic. Okay, I can see chat now, let's go. All right, so Megan says error, yep. Yep, the loss function is measuring error. Any other ideas, guys? I'm actually measuring a couple of different things. Error is like the, the most, yeah. It's the average of how oft your predicted y hats are um, from the actual data. Yeah, 
so yeah, similar to what Megan said, like how how off your errors are, errors on average. Yeah. And actually, to add on to, uh, what you guys said is that, given the fact that we have that our loss function is actually in terms of our weights and biases, we can actually determine cool enough is that we can determine um, how much our different weights and biases contribute to our error function. So we can determine like how much our weight for number of hours studied is making our error function or, or is what, what the impact of that weight is in our function. And so that's really useful because we can now uh, use that, that difference, um, that, that factor to change our weights to um, make them more accurate for our data set. All right, so we have our loss function. Now what we wanna do is that our loss function, like you guys said, is our measurement of error. And so what do we wanna do? We wanna minimize our error, obviously. We don't want, a function, uh, we don't want our function, our algorithm to be super erroneous. So we wanna make that error as close to zero as possible. And so our loss, as we mentioned earlier, is actually a, a factor of our weights and biases. And so what we can do is we can update our weight and biases to lower our error for different um, for our data set. And so, like I said earlier, we want as low of a loss function as possible because that means our model is not is very accurate. It means that its, it's error for every data point is really low. And so what we need to do now is that we need to determine the weights or change our weights slightly or a lot potentially to make sure that we can minimize our loss for our data set. And so the question is, how might we do that? I'm gonna ask you guys for like, maybe you guys' first ideas and what you might, what you guys think, because we covered a bit of math, but I just wanna hear some high level ideas and what you guys think we might do based on uh, based with, uh, down the fact that we have our loss function and we have that value for our certain data points. So what, what, might, you, what might you guys do to um, find those optimal weights given our loss function? Uh, feel free to write it in chat or unmute. Also, these can be really high level ideas. Uh, we'll get into the more nitty gritty in a second, but just like, what would you guys think to do um, with the loss function to make our weights better. Hopefully people are writing in chat. Might, might be kind of a long, actually it can be, it can be short response too. So. Oh, wait till we get a response. It can be any, it can be anything, high level, low level. It can be really detailed. It can be really high level, um, anything. Just what do you guys think so far? You covered a bit of stuff, a bit of math and a bit of theory. Um, with, with the loss function, what can you do to make our weights better? Ah, so Elliot says, uh, use the gradient to adjust the weights. And yeah, that's a, great, that's a great suggestion actually. And so we'll get into that in the coming slides, but um, a really powerful technique. Uh, oh yeah, no worries, you guys uh, don't. Uh, um, so feel free, feel free to ask questions actually if it doesn't um, make sense so far. But like Elliot suggested, we can use the gradient to adjust the weights and we'll get into that in a second. Um, but if that doesn't make sense, just remember for now that our loss function is our um, calculation of error and we wanna make it as small as possible. So we'll get into how to make that as small as possible, but a really important tool is the gradient. And so as you guys can see on the page right now, the way we actually minimize the value of a function is called gradient descent. And so you guys can see two functions on, um, on the slide. And for basically for both of them, we have, let's think of, think of them as cost functions. And so what we want to do is that we want to get to the, like the, we want to get to the value of all of our, of the cost functions. We want to get the lowest possible value. 
And so what we do is that we start, let's say, on a very high value. And basically, we ride the slope downwards. The way we do that is we follow the gradient. We'll get into that a bit. Basically, we ride the slope downwards till we get to the bottom. And once you realize that we can't go down anymore, we just stop. And so you guys can see that that this actually depend, depends on like the topography or like the, the waviness and like the shape of the domain. And so on the right side, it's actually a bit more complicated because there's actually are many different valleys. There's like this one small valley um, um, and there's a bigger valley too. And so gradient descent is actually really useful, uh, but it can have some trouble with finding the, finding this, the this lowest valley. So let's say, Right now we're, we're finding this valley, but let's say for, some, for example, this valley on the, um, on the right is a bit smaller or a bit lower. We, we might not find that valley, but it's okay because this valley is probably good enough for our finding because it's pretty low itself. So um, yeah, and quick question as Weston you asked in chat, what are the graphs in the screen mapping? I touched on it a bit, but um, given what we talked about with our loss function and this graph, what are we graphing here? And feel free to unmute um, or write in chat. Also, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask now because I know this can be a bit daunting. But trust me, once you guys um, um, write some code with it soon and in the later weeks, as well as um, get used to it and get it into your brains. Um, It'll make more sense as time goes on. So if it doesn't make sense now, uh, it'll make sense soon. But yeah, the question still stands. Uh, what are the graphs mapping and what are the axes for both of them? Or you can answer, answer it for one if you want. Or both. And I mentioned it a bit earlier, but um, yeah. Uh, so Elliot says X is weights, Y is air. So yeah, that's a good start. Um, I'm guessing you're talking about, I guess both of them are, yeah, the one on the, on the left. Um, X is one of the weights. Y might not be the air. Um, I still keep moving because we're into the time, but um, you're correct that X, X is one of the weights. But the important distinction is that y is also another weight, and z is actually our, our cost function. And so the important distinction is that we have x and y as our independent variables. And so remember from before how our loss function is in terms of our, um, our weights and biases, and so our weights and bias. And so our independent variables here, x and y, are both weights. And so our Z, fun, our Z in this example is our um, uh, error term or our loss function. And same for the one on the right. Uh, on the right, we have theta zero and theta one. Those are our weights. And J of theta zero and theta one is our loss function. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, feel free to ask any questions um, that didn't make sense. But basically, because our weights are independent variables, we had them on. Um, they are the things that are, are those they are the independent variables and the y or the z term or the vertical axis is our cost function in this case. Yep. All right. I have so, a question. So, you go ahead. Um, how come how come you wouldn't find the plane that's parallel to the xy plane or, or xy axis? And then see what like the lowest intersection point is with the uh, cost function. Is that like too much computation? Uh, it could be. Um, so for like really simple functions, like the one we have on the left, you could do that. Uh, the thing is, typically loss functions are with like a lot of variables. So let's say you have like we have the midterm example, right? We we thought up on the fly like five examples. Um, that um, uh, of features. And so we could have like maybe like say, let's say 20 features that go into figuring out um, why exactly um, that, that, that correlate to your performance in a midterm. And so a 20 variable um, independent variable function um, will be pretty complicated. And also um, 
they'll probably be too expensive to um, find the minimum um, another way, I would say. Uh, Vashnavi and Ben, feel free to add on if you have any ideas. But that's my first intuition is that, yeah, it's probably too computationally expensive and gradient descent is pretty efficient in terms of speed. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Um, I think the models we're going to be looking at in beginner track, which is linear and logistic regression, you can solve it analytically, like the left side, or like how you mentioned, where you just find the zeros of the gradient and then um, uh, like find a minimum. Uh, because the the loss functions are going to look more like the graph on the left. But in general, when we look, if you go into advanced track and we go into like neural networks and more complicated models, the loss function is going to look something more like on the right, where it's a really complex surface that you have to optimize over. So gradient descent is an algorithm that generalizes really well um, to any kind of cost function or any or really complex models. Uh, even though like even for simple models, like the ones we're going to be looking at, you don't really need an algorithm like gradient descent. but um, we want to show off gradient descent because it's going to be really useful later on. And then another question is, um, you said the, the starting points for evaluating the cost function were arbitrary, right? Yeah. Do you ever like run it multiple times to see if the gradient descent, like starting from different starting points to see if like you get a different gradient descent path um, that leads to a, like a lower valley? Yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, if you see it, like the graph on the right, I don't know how often it's actually done in practice because it might pick, it's a lot, it might be a lot of guessing. I think usually what, um, at least what I've done uh, for my like jobs is that like I've like initialized them to like random variables um, using like different statistical randomization algorithms. But um, if you look at the equation, uh, the thing on the right, we have two peaks over here, like the, the two red peaks. And so let's say, so let's say we um, the first time we initialize our variables, our weights start at the first peak on the left. We might find the current value we find that, um, right now, like about here. Can you guys can you guys see my mouse? I'm not sure, um, but yeah. So you guys you start here, you go down the steepest path till you get down here. But let's say you start on the right path. You might not get all the way down here. You might actually come into this valley right here, and then realize that like you don't want to come back up this. Uh, up this uh, valley because that's like finding a worse a, a worse cost function, a wor or worse weights for your cost function, and so you might just stop here. But this one on the, on the right um, is actually worse than the one on the left um, for uh, in terms of a valley, like in terms of cost function. So your cost is higher with these weights over here than the weights on the left. And so what that means is that if you do change your initial weight, you might find different a different valley. But um, it's kind of hard to make a really cool, pro like a really in-depth process of how to initialize your weights. And so typically you start with weights and find the first value you see, I think. Does that help? Um, hopefully that helps. But... Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And we'll get into exactly how we go down these um, down to the values soon. But basically, you can think of like our starting point is like we initialize our weights to something, and then we slowly modify them to make the cost function lower. And so, here's a bit of uh, a bit of um, terminology or more equations to just um, demonstrate this. And so, let's say we have our cost function is in terms of a bunch of variables, X and Y. And so uh, what we wanna do is we're calculating the gradient here. We're calculating what the slope is uh, or like what the slope, the rate of change is in different, in different directions. So we're calculating an X1, X2 to the XN direction. And so in, in this graph right here, we'd only do two of them. We have X and Y. And then so one thing we'll get to is that if you follow the gradient or you follow like this, the, this this vector, uh, you'll actually go um, you actually get to the you actually go down towards the valley the fastest. Um, so that's pretty good. And so what we basically do is basically we subtract um, our current weights. Uh, actually, the term the we subtract our variable uh, our current weights from 
we subtract the gradient from the current weights. And so basically what we're doing is we're basically figuring out uh, what the steepest path down this hill is. And we're, subtract, um, we're subtracting those changes uh, from our current weights to get closer to the bottom, uh, to the value of, the, of, of, the, um, of this curve. If that makes sense. And we'll, um, if anyone has questions about alpha, we'll get to alpha in a second. Um, but at a high level, basically what we're doing is that we're trying to get down this value as fast as possible to lower our cost function as fast as possible. Any questions about that? Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm no still kind of confused. So how does this equation kind of represent like we're trying to get to the um, lowest point as fast as possible? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, uh, we'll go into it a bit more later, but a quick example I can give is, let's say currently our Z, our Z value is our cost function. That makes sense, right? And so uh, we can let our X and Y variable, let's say, let's say X is the number of hours studied, our, our weight for our number of hours studied, and our Y function is our weight for number of classes taken. And so at the start right here at the very top, we have a certain, uh, we have, initialize our values for our weights of uh, X and Y um, for number of hours spent and studying a number of classes taken to let's say like, I don't know what this is, but like 0 0.75 comma 1.75, I think that's our initial weights value. And so what we're doing is that it turns out um, just by some mathematical, um, some, some, um, some math that if you, um, follow the gradient. The gradient's a vector, remember? So the gradient points in a direction. And so at this top point, the gradient will point uh, from this point down towards um, down towards the middle. And so, oh shoot, I clicked the button by accident, my bad. Um, but basically what we see is that if you take the gradient, uh, the gradient of the, um, the cost function at this value, we'll see that it points towards um, it points towards the, the, the bottom of the valley. And we wanna to go towards the bottom of the valley because the valley is where, the bottom of the valley is where the cost function is the lowest. And so the gradient points in that direction. So we wanna follow it down to the bottom. If that makes sense. Uh, okay, okay, I see, thank you. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. And hopefully that makes sense to everyone. If you don't, uh, feel free to ask another question, um, but a uh, quick synopsis is that we initialize our weights to something and we take the gradient, which is a bunch of partial derivatives of our weights. And the gradient thankfully points towards the valley where our, where our cost function is lowest. And so we wanna follow it down into the valley. Um, yeah, actually analysis, I, I guess I can give you a quick, uh, a, a quick, uh, oh no, that's good, that's good. I had an analogy prepped, but it's not the best analogy, so. Uh, actually, I'll just give an analogy because I actually not like the analogy. The basic analogy I was thinking of is that gradient descent. So like, you know how like, if you walk down a hill, that's kind of steep, typical people, will, like it's like slowly walk down, like they're like, I don't know. If, if we all walk down, walk down hills or something. Like you like walk one foot after the other, right? Really slowly, right? And so that's like following like a random path. So let's say you're following a random path you might not get, you might take the whole circle around to the bottom of the valley. The gradient descent is like, it's like a, a drunk person going down a hill. They just run down the hill because they have like, they want to get there fastest and they have no care for their safety. And so basically you can think of it like that. It's an analogy I always use for a lot of times, but uh, yeah, gradient descent gets there really fast um, by taking the steepest path to the lowest cost function. Hope that analogy also up. I like that analogy a lot, so uh, yeah. Oh yeah, and Austin asked the gradient is just the direction, right? Not the magnitude. And yes, um, the gradient is the direction. Um, but also your, um, um, yeah, the gradient is, just, is the direction. So you take the direction of it. Um, I think the, the magnitude, I, saw, I think also is determined by the gradient. Um, I think you take the magnitude of the gradient. Um, I think that also, um, it comes into play with alpha, yeah, okay. Uh, basically that, that, that um, is impacted by alpha. And so think of, um, think of our gradient as a unit vector in this case, but um, 
magnitude comes in play with alpha. So yeah, the gradient is a direction, and the magnitude of the gradient impacts with alpha to figure out how fast we go down. Sorry if that confused it more, but um, yeah, the gradient is a direction, yes. Uh, but it's a vector, so it has a magnitude too. So we can go down the gradient direction. In that case. Yeah. Yeah, the magnitude tells you the steepness. Yeah, like Ben said. So, all right, moving on. Uh, let's look at a simple example. So, single value variable gradient descent. So, let's say f is our cost function right now. It's a function of one variable. So, let's say our, our weight for our one variable is, num let's say we're making a model, but only based on number of, of hours studied. And so, in this case, our gradient is just one derivative. And so f prime, our derivative, is just like a slope, that blue line on the side uh, over here, this line. It tells you whether the function is increasing or decreasing at that point. And so if f is our, uh, if f is our loss function, the derivative at that point will tell you if the function is increasing or, de or if the loss function is increasing or decreasing at that point. So if the, if the, if the error is increasing or decreasing, at this current weight. And so based on that, as you guys know from derivatives, if f of x is positive, that means the function is increasing. And so that means that as x increases, uh, f of x or y also increases. And so um, because f of x is our loss function, we all know we want to decrease f of x. And so um, yeah, we want we want to make f of x as small as possible. So in this case, um, because f because f prime of x is positive here, uh, we want to subtract x so that we go down this curve. If that makes sense. So let's say right now uh, we're taking the we're taking the derivative at this point at like what is that? What two? I guess I don't know. We're taking we're taking the deriv the, the derivative or at uh, x equals two, and so at that point x equals two. The derivative is positive. So that means at that point, if you increase our weight x, we're going to increase our error. So what we want to do actually is that we want to go down the, the error curve. So we want to go down. So we want to decrease x in this case. And on the, on the contrary or on the opposite, um, opposite situation, um, if f time of x is negative, so let's say we're looking at the other side, of, if we're looking at the other side of the, this curve, if it's parabola, and we were on looking at x equals negative two, let me take the derivative here. Um, if f of prime of x is negative, we want to uh, increase x, go to the right, so that we get closer to the minimum. So that's gradient descent in a simple case. And as we add more weights, um, we get more and more variables. But looking at it, at it from this perspective can help clarify exactly what we're doing, is that we're changing our weights to get our cost function as low as possible. And so, yeah, to summarize, we want to minimize f, f of x. And um, if f prime of x is positive, we want to subtract something from it. And if f prime of x is negative, we want to add something to x to make it go closer to the bottom. And so the question we have is here is, how do we do that? And so what we do is that we actually use f prime of x itself to help with that. And so, uh, if f prime of x is positive, we want to subtract. If f prime of x is negative, we want to add. So basically, we're doing the opposite of what f prime of x is. So we're basically um, trying to um, decrease it. So we're basically kind of the opposite of what f prime of x is. And so what that gives us is that we're trying to update our weight x by taking the old value of x and subtracting a constant called alpha by the derivative of x. And so what that basically means is that um, we're, called, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about this alpha later. Uh, actually, we're talking about it right now. Um, it's called learning rate. Basically, this is uh, a factor that we, we as humans determine for our model ahead of time. Um, and basically this tells the model how fast to um, learn from a situation. So you can imagine if, F, if alpha is really large, right? So right now we're at x equals two um, as our weight. If alpha is really large, we're gonna make really big changes to our weight every time. So let's say, f, let's say alpha is two, right? And our f prime of x, our f prime of x is um, um, what is it? It's like four, right? So 
currently x is 2, if you do 2 minus 2 times 4, we're going to go all the way over from x equals 2 to x equals negative 6. So we're going to keep flip-flopping. We're going to flip go from here, which is a pretty low cost, to a really high cost all of a sudden. And so it's really important that we, to we choose alpha carefully so that we don't just bounce around on the loss function and so that we, slow we, we actually get down the, um, the curve as, um, as fast as possible, but not too fast that we don't get down the curve. Does that make sense? So if alpha is too high, it's going to go from like over here to over here to over here, over and over again. And you might not actually get closer to the bottom. If alpha is too small, you're going to go really slowly. You're going to go like x equals 2, x equals 1.9, x equals 1.8, 1.7. And like 100 years later, you're going to get to x equals 0. And you're going to be like, was it even worth it to make a model? That took 100 years to make it. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to actually optimize that and basically find a good value of alpha that um, gets us down to 0 in a good amount of time, but also not too fast that it we actually get to the bottom, so that we actually get to the bottom. And so typically what I've seen is that alpha is typically about, it's like anywhere from like 0 0.05 to like even smaller than that. But it's typically not too large of a factor, but it depends on your data, of course. But um, yeah, basically alpha is how fast we want our model to change based on the error function. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions about that? Feel free to ask in chat or unmute. All right, I'll keep moving on. Feel free to interrupt me in the future if you have any questions. But yeah, we talked about this a bit earlier, but in multi dimensions, multiple dimensions, it's, it's a bit different, but it's actually pretty similar to what you think. And so, like we alluded to earlier, the gradient is the direction of steepest ascent. And so basically, if you calculate the gradient, it tells you what direction to go to, to get up, get to get to a higher cost function uh, when possible, or a higher function value when possible. And so that means if you go in a direction, same direction as a gradient, we're going to increase the value of the function. So in our case, um, I misspoke a bit earlier about the direction, but basically, if you go in the direction of the gradient, we're going to increase our cost function, which we don't want to do. And so to compensate for that, what we're going to do instead, we're not going to go in the direction of gradient. We're going to go in the opposite direction. Because if we're going, if the direction of the gradient is the steepest ascent, that means the opposite direction is the steepest descent. And so we go, we're going to go in the opposite direction of our gradient to get to the lowest possible cost function. So that's how we get gradient descent. Basically, um, for every set of weights, we're going to calculate the gradient. And then we're going to, based on the equation we had in the last slide of x minus x equals x minus um, alpha, um, alpha times gradient, we're going to um, go, down the, um, go down that cost function you guys saw in a couple of slides ago. Um, yeah. And so a bit more formally right now. So we have x as our vector of weights, x1 through xn. And we have a gradient, which is also a, vec uh, a vector of n, um, of n, um, an n-dimensional vector. But this is, this is of all the partial derivatives. And so what we do, again, is what we, um, with vectors now, is that we have x. We're going to update x by subtracting, um, subtracting our learning rate, alpha, which is a, con a constant uh, real number, by our gradient of our function. And if you guys know, um, are probably familiar with, um, vector addition and subtraction, but because um, x, the, the x variable and the gradient of x, uh, f of x uh, variable um, are the same dimensions, we can subtract them in this case. And oh, I didn't talk about this earlier, but the upside down triangle sign um, is a gradient symbol. Um, so that's important to know. Sorry, I didn't talk about that earlier, but yeah. Any questions about this formal version? Uh, it's basically the same as the old equation, but we now have vectors because they're easier to use. All right, moving on. And so now what we want to do is we want to minimize, uh, like we did wanted to do before, we wanted to minimize our gradient. Now let's actually write out what that really entails. And so 
what we want to learn about, we want to learn for, we want, we want to change our weights and our bias term. And so remember our equation for mean squared error or our mean squared loss function? Uh, it was one over M of the summation uh, from one to M of Y hat I minus Y I. And so what we do here is that we take the partial derivative of that with respect to uh, the jth weight, so weight j. And so what we get here is that our partial derivative in this case is 2 over m, up the summation from 1 to m, of our, our error times um, the feature's value. So um, this is just a bit of algebra. You guys can put it in your free time if you want, um, or take it for us, because um, um, it's uh, just a bit of um, algebra. But the partial derivative in terms of wj is this. And so what we can do is that we can plug it into our update equation, which was x equals x minus alpha times the gradient. And you can plug it in. And so now we have that. Um, our gradient in this case, because we're, only, we're looking at only this one variable. Uh, we're, not looking, we're not looking at the vector yet. We're just putting in the derivative here or the partial derivative. So our new wj is going to be our old wj minus our alpha times our partial derivative for wj, and same for b. And so we can do this for every single w and every single b, and we can make it a bit more form. Uh, we can make it more into a vector in the coming slides, I think. So, yeah. Any questions about that? Um, the variables, um, I think. I have a, another random question about alpha. Um, I know you said you don't want it to be too big because um, you might just like flip flop across the cost function. Um, but I feel like in some scenarios, um, your Y value would be, I guess, qualitatively more intuitive to you, so you would know how much change uh, typically your gradient's going to go in. Would it ever be the scenario where you want to uh, change your alpha so that you only move a certain uh, value in y every time with your gradient, rather than like a certain value in x? Does that make sense at all? Uh oh. So you mean like always go down a certain direct, like a certain not yeah. cost function? Yeah. Um, I would say that is possible. I would say that it's still, I think gradient descent is uh, easier to calculate as well. Because if you're doing that, if, if, you're, if you're going down a certain amount of in the cost function, mm -hmm. you need to calculate the value of change in x for that to happen. Oh, I see. And that, that's like a equation solve right there. And if you have like a 30 dimensional equation, could be a little bit complicated. Um, and also I'm not sure if that would take you in the optimal direction all the time because that might not follow the direction or, or you're saying you follow the gradient but only for a certain amount. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, but um, the cost function, I guess what I would think is that, um, this is not for sure, but what I would think is that um, you have to make this different because like, um, Let's say your cost at first is like two, like a hundred or something. So you go you go down by like five five every time. Mm -hmm. By the time you get down to like three, you can't go down five anymore, or else you went like negative cost um, or like all the way around. Fast, so you need to modify yeah. it another way. I'm not sure if that's done or not, or like why you wouldn't do it, but I think that could be one reason. I think the typical reason that it is a gradient descent is just really easy to calculate and really fast as well. Um, I'll look into it myself. I don't know if Ben or Washington I mean, have any additional thoughts on that though. Um, feel free to chime in. Sorry, I didn't understand your question completely. Were you asking whether we could adjust the learning rate in terms of each very in terms of each feature? Yeah, so instead of arbitrarily setting a learning weight and moving in an X direction every time, right? Like uh, I would how would I phrase it? Um, like you would set the learning rate so that you go in the same direction as your gradient, but you only move a certain amount in Y every time, rather than that Y magnitude being arbitrarily dependent on your X that you get. I think 
the, the magnitudes for each of the, so each of the components of the gradient are independent of each other. There isn't any dependence, right? I'm not sure where the confusion, I'm not sure I understand your question. I, um, yeah, man. yeah, we can also um, talk about this more office hours or after the workshop, but like Ben was saying, they're both independent and I don't really see the advantage of, maybe I don't understand your question completely, of having a different learning rate for each for each feature, because ultimately mm -hmm. the gradient is telling you the direction of steepest, as, or like steep, it's giving you the steepest direction. So the learning rate is just, inter it just determines how fast you're learning. But um, earlier we we're talking about this in the chat, but the gradient itself has a magnitude, right? So I think the mag the magnitude that you should be traveling in for each for each feature is already captured within the gradient. So I don't think that's something you have to adjust for within the alpha, within the learning rate. Yeah, uh, we can dive into it more after learning office hours if you want to. Um, Sweet, thank you. Yeah. And also I guess another thing people do sometimes is that they like slowly, slowly decrease alpha over time. But, um, that also works. But um, anyways, if you guys didn't, get, didn't fully get that, don't worry about it. It's just a, uh, fine tuning, tuning with alpha. But the important detail here is that now we know exactly how we're gonna modify our, our weights and our bias um, to get to our optimal cost, to get to our lowest cost value. And yeah, um, in the slides, there's actually a link to the whole derivation of the gradients. And so if you guys wanna figure, if you guys wanna know how exactly we got to these um, values for the, partial derivatives for the weights and bias, you can go ahead and click here and you get um, go into um, get to the slides. And so you guys can think of this as similar to um, the best fit curve um, that you guys might do for uh, many, many uh, softwares have right now. If you guys have like an, have used Excel before, Excel has like a thing where like if you put in all your data, it can find a best fit line for you. And so this is like, um, this is an example on the right uh, is an example in two dimensions. So you have only two variables. And so you want to find the line of best fit. And so you can only one variable. So you have our you have your midterm scores here and you have like number of hours spent. And that would be a linear relationship. And so uh, in more dimensions, it'd look even more complicated. Um, and so um, that would be that. Um, and here's you see you can see on the left right here. Um, this is like the gradient descent part of this for finding the optimal slope and intercept. And so what it's doing right now is that it starts at like a certain, a, a certain slope and intercept, which happens to be these, this like negative five and negative 10 for M and B. And then we take the gradient um, or we take the partial derivatives, which is the gradient. And then from that, we figure out how we need to change our weights to get closer to the bottom. And so you can see as in, in a couple of steps, like, in like 15 steps, you can get from an error of like 20 to an error of 0 0.5 or three, actually an no, error of 300. Wow, an error from 300 to an hour of 0 0.5. And so you can see just how fast gradient descent is as well as how well it, it does um, at um, optimizing your cost function or making it as small as possible. And so um, we're gonna go into, uh, we're actually gonna do this, do this ourselves uh, later in the, in the quarter when you work on a project. So look forward to that. And so now that we've done a great descent for many different test case, for many different variables, we, um, okay, we can now, uh, we now have um, pretty well-trained weights. So we now have weights that are pretty accurate for the whole, uh, for the whole data set. So now we know that like, if we multiply our weights by our, um, by our data for like um, number of hours studied or number of um, hours spent procrastinating in our midterm example. If we multiply our weights by our, our, our weights by the data points plugged in, we should get a pretty close example, a pretty close estimate of what the midterm score is. And so now what we can do is that now that we've trained our weights um, to be pretty accurate, we can test it on new data. And so remember in testing from last time, um, uh, we still have our data points. And so um, 
what we can do, actually no, this case is different. Uh, we take a portion of our data, that data has both parameters for our input parameters, which are like number of hours studied, number of hours been procrastinating, number of classes taken. We put that into our model. And from that model, we get our prediction. Meanwhile, we, ha we actually have like the, the, actual um, the actual target score or the actual label um, or actual midterm score um, for all of those sets of, um, sets of parameters. And so we keep those to the side. And so we have, we have our predictions using the input features. And what we can do is that since we have the actual two, two midterm scores, we can subtract the two midterm scores and our um, predictions. And so similar to our loss function before, we can calculate our loss function, but this time with our trained model and the loss of our trained model will tell us how well our model is performing. So if our, if our loss is like 0.5, that's actually pretty good because that means we're uh, our average loss is really close. We're actually pretty close to all of our data points. Even if our, if our loss is like 200, then we know we're like really off on our data points and we need to get more data into our model and train on uh, more data or that our model isn't actually, our, our data set isn't actually linear. There's not actually, there's not actually a linear relation between our data points. And so either way, we learn something from our, from our loss function. Um, and it'll, it'll tell us how good our model is, or how well is our model has been. And so we did a lot right there. That's a lot of stuff. You guys did, uh, took on a lot of information really fast. And so what we just did is an example of supervised learning. And we'll get into a bit more of this um, later with our, with our future stuff, uh, especially next week with our next uh, workshop. But to summarize, what we did is that we told our, our model what the right answer was. We told it what the actual midterm score was for a person given certain parameters for them. And based on that, it, it trained itself, it changed its param it changed its weights to get closer to the right answer for many different answers, for many different people. And so supervised learning is a pretty large field, but typically there's two two big two big subgroups of it. Classification, which is basically um, um, coming up with output labels. So like, um, this can be anything from like, let's predict the score, uh, let's like, uh, this, this can be like our old example of AlexNet from AlexNet from two weeks ago, if you guys remember that, basically what is this, what's in this picture? Is it a dog, is it a cat? Things like that. That's classification where it's just saying, what is this, like classify this as something. And today we talked about regression, which is basically mapping one set of continuous inputs to another set of continuous inputs. And so, our first set of inputs is our input parameters. So our number of hours spent, our, num our studying, our number of hours spent procrastinating, et cetera. And our continuous output is our midterm score because that can go from zero to a hundred or even higher if you have extra credit. So, yeah. And so in our case, um, or actually in general, just, um, you, you'll, you'll, you'll need to figure out based on your problem, like what you're trying to tackle, what type of model to use. So you can ask yourself a couple of questions to figure out, do you want to use a reg regression model or do you want to use a classification model? Like for example, are you trying to figure out if a thing is a, is, if, if a, thing is a number, is a cat or a dog or an ice cream cone? That would probably be classification. On the other hand, let's say you want to figure out the number of re uh, fish in a certain reef and you have like data from a bunch of reefs. Um, and, like you have data on like reef, reef size, like reef, I don't know. What are some other things like uh, human human interaction, things like that, and that impacts the um, number of fish in the reef. That's more of a regression thing because your inputs um, are continuous variables. So that means that they are like on a they're like numbers from a, on like a large scale uh, numbers basically on a, a continuous scale, and they turn into a continuous continuous output, which is another number. And last example, or I think it's last example, is mail versus spam. Um, we all have like in our emails, like default spam filters. And so in this case, there's not only a continuous, continuous output to consider. There's not like a, there's not like a zero, a one and a two and a three for, is it a spam or not spam? It's, it's either it's spam or it's not spam. And so that's classification. And so, yeah, today we talked about one example. Um, a supervised learning, which is regression. 
And in general, in this workshop series for beginner track, we're going to be talking about a lot of supervised learning stuff. Um, we'll get into more of it next week. And yeah, next week we're talking about logistic regression, which is classification instead of prediction, instead of regression. And so, yeah, thank you guys for coming. Uh, it was fun um, having you guys. Um, fill out the uh, feedback form if you can before going. It really helps us a lot. Uh, and event code is Portland if you guys missed it. And yeah, thank you guys. Any questions, you can feel free to ask them. But yeah, you guys are good to go if you have no questions or Last comments. Note regarding the feedback form, it really only takes two minutes, but um, we take the feedback really seriously because we want to improve these workshops in the future. And we also offer these tracks again in the future. Uh, so even if you don't have anything, um, even if you don't have any criticism on like what we could have done better, please let us know what we did well, what we explained well, and we'd love to hear what we could do better. Yeah, and we even, we even try to improve like from workshop to workshop. So it's in mm -hmm. your benefit, for, it's in your own best interest to fill out yeah. that, that feedback for them. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just Thanks wanted for... to. Uh, or go ahead. Thanks, someone else. No, no, let's go ahead. Uh, I wanted to clarify a little bit more, like what alpha, or like how we can determine alpha for, for like our our, our model. Could you like maybe just like expand a bit on like because like it says yeah. it's a constant. But I'm still a little bit confused on like how we could implement it. Uh yeah. So here I'll give this example on this slide again. But alpha is what we call the hyperparameter, or basically a parameter that we ourselves as the person making the model chooses. So it's kind of arbitrary. Typically, you want to have an alpha that's relatively small. Um, we talked about the problem earlier about bouncing around. And so uh, did you get that part, Jeffrey, about how you want, don't want an alpha too big because then you're going to bounce around the cost function? Yeah, so I think it's like something around like 0 0.05 or something I missed. Yeah, it's point, uh, Mostly what I've seen is like, it depends on their data, obviously, but I think a lot of people use like something about like 0 0.05 or 0 0.005. It depends on your yeah. data for sure. Um, but um, basically that value was reached, I think from a lot of testing on like, if, you're, if your alpha is too small, like I explained, um, you're not gonna get there fast enough. And like, what's the point of making this model that you don't get in a hundred years? And if your model is, if your alpha is too large, you're gonna bounce from like up here to, oh shoot, I keep clicking the screen. From like up here to like up here over and over again, because um, our gradient right here is, is like in this direction, but if you multiply alpha by too much, um, you're gonna go from like here all the way up to like this end curve and you're gonna keep bouncing from like here, 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 never get to the actual bottom. And so that alpha of like about 0 0.05 is typically, I think what's seen, but it depends on your data, of course, but that's like a, a middle ground average of like not going too slow and not bouncing around your cost function over and over. Yeah, I also want to add on to that. There, there are methods to determine like these hyperparameters. So what you can do is you can reserve um, like a subset of the data. It's like testing data, but we call it validation. Um, and this validation data set, what we do is we train our model on the training data set and then we evaluate it on our validation data set to see how it performs. And then we change one of the hyperparameters, like maybe we increase the learning rate or decrease the learning rate. And then we train on our training data again, and then we evaluate it on the validation data. And doing that in that process, we can kind of tune our hyperparameters. Um, I'm not sure if we have specific slides on this later on, but I think we'll definitely implement something like this when we go into the, the project, the, the like, um, the, the hands-on project in the last two workshops. But yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Thanks for uh, helping clarify, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the great question. Um, could you just write like a like an if statement that that like just compares your previous cost to like the new cost to make sure you're not bouncing around too much. Like if, if the new cost is just higher than your previous one, and that's just an indicator that you've gone too far, right? For your, your learning variable. Yeah, that's one way. That's like, um, or like during your training process, like if you, if you notice that the, uh, the, the error is like rising again, then you can stop it early 
I think the technique is it's called early stopping. Um, oh, you can you can like run it in real time and then see what yeah. it's doing. Typically, what you, you yeah. do is like you like print out like you're like, you're, like training over like nine. Let's say you have like so let's say you have like a thousand midterm scores. Uh -huh. You have like a for a for loop for that, right? And so you can basically print out as it's happening, um, like what your current cost function is. And so if you see the cost function and your error function increasing over time, you can like yeah early stop like Ben mentioned, and then you can like tune your you can tune your hyper uh, your hyperparameters. Um, as for the if put, you, you guess you asked about adding an if statement. I would say typically that's not done because if you add an if statement to calculate the next cost, that means you're calculating you're calculating two cost functions per every loop. So that's like double the computation. So typically use early stop because it's just easier. Oh, I see. Yeah, and also gradient descent isn't the only algorithm. This is just like, or where it's it is like. There are other mod things you can you can modify this a little bit. Like, um, I think when we do, or I don't actually don't think we do it in uh, beginner track, but uh, when we implement uh, the model or implement logistic or linear regression, we can use other optimizers like Adam which is based on gradient descent, but it has some changes to it. Or another one is like momentum. So the idea is like, if you have a lot of hills and valleys in this, um, uh, or I guess we don't, we haven't gotten to it, but like you notice how some of these, um, the loss functions, they're not necessarily, yeah, like that one, that they're not necessarily like a bowl shape. So um, you can get stuck into one of these small valleys. And so an, a, a, chain, a modification yeah, yeah, there you go. There's an advanced plus plus workshop all about optimizers and the different advantages and disadvantages of them. Um, but yeah, so momentum is like they're adding a adding a factor to kind of get you over some of these hills to potentially um, reach a lower minimum than if you were just using plain gradient descent. We should probably start stop recording. Right, let me do that.